Hello, welcome back. Part two of HVAC, AC stuff. All right, so we left off talking about some components of the AC uh, cycle, right? The, the, the parts in the vehicle. Something we haven't talked about is the electrical portion of it. So, of course, all of this um, uh, mechanical components relies on electrical components to function. There's pressure sensors that operate, um, and they look kind of like this. So you have a four-pin one like this that runs a uh, switch to a fan, like the high-speed fan of the condenser. So when your AC is on, this fan turns on to help reject that heat that we talked about earlier. But also that compressor clutch. Remember that coil, the electromagnetic field that's built to make the clutch connect to the pulley and the arbor of the compressor? That's got to go through a series of switches that are low and high pressure so we don't damage the system. Because think about if the system had no pressure, that can uh, damage it because we turn the compressor on with no pressure, there's no oil circulating. If we turn on with high pressure, then it can explode, right? We don't need to be compressing, making more pressure. So we have a low and a high pressure switch and a medium pressure switch. When the system turns on, that turns on the fan. So that's what these pressure switches are. And of course, rats chew these wires. And that's a big reason why these systems don't work. So it's something to think about as a tech. Uh, again, condenser fans can either be electric, mechanical. They have fluid coupling viscous clutch right here, like we talked about on the cooling systems week. So, and then back to that refrigerant cycle, kind of big picture. Now remember, the compressor, this is what builds that pressure, comes out and goes in the condenser as a hot, high-pressure uh, gas, the vapor here it says. But gas, as it comes through, this condenser condenses to a liquid. It's still uh, high-pressure and it's hot. goes through this expansion valve, either fixed orifice or this variable thermal expansion valve. And then through here is this kind of droplet-y, um, cool, cold, low-pressure side. goes the evaporator where it boils. It's going to turn into a vapor. And that liquid uh, then again turns into a vapor, absorbs the heat from the pasture compartment, and then it transfers that heat over to the condenser. So essentially from the evaporator to the condenser, we're transferring heat, which is interesting. We won't talk about much in this class, but if we put the condenser in the car and the evaporator outside, we can put heat in the car from outside. And you're thinking, well, yeah, but wouldn't it have to be hot outside to do that? Not necessarily. So just because it's 30 degrees out, it's cold to us, that doesn't mean there's no heat outside. There's less heat than 60 degrees, but there still is heat. So the system will still transfer heat from outside to inside. That's known as a heat pump. Houses are uh, heated and cooled this way on the uh, East Coast, from what I understand. I never lived there, but that's from what I understand. So that's kind of the big, big picture AC refrigerant cycle process, all the components. Um, this goes in obviously more in depth than the engine's AC class, so look forward to that. So a little bit about diagnosis and repair and how these uh, systems work. First thing I like to tell, and this works for not just HVAC AC, but this is kind of a six step diagnostic procedure process. Everyone has their own procedure, but for the most part, it's similar to this one. You wanna verify the customer's complaint, determine related symptoms, analyze a symptom, isolate the cause, you gotta correct the cause, and then make sure it's working before you give it back to the customer. And all of this can actually be uh, kind of condensed into what's called um, SSCC, symptom to system, component to cause. So SSCC, you find the symptom, that's the complaint. Uh, you find the system that that is related to. You find the cause, and you know, symptom to system, component, sorry, the component is next, and then you find the cause. What caused it to fail? fail. fail. SSCC. So... Some other system checks you can do, and this varies on car. You can see this in the service manual to make sure the system's working dynamically is it'll have you either open the doors, open the windows, turn the AC on max, AC, recirculate. It'll have you do certain things to make sure the temp of the vent is in the correct range. So, And then there's a sight glass. Again, I mentioned earlier, older systems had these. Newer ones, not so much. Became a weak point. But they allow you to look and see if it's sufficiently charged or not. If you had bubbles going by, there's something wrong with the system. Um, another AC uh, kind of check thing you can do is visually check for stains, leaking. Uh, check systems pressures, we'll get to in a second with the manifold. Uh, you can recover the refrigerant, which is a fancy way of removing it. You can't just drain it out, you have to recover it. And then you evacuate the system, which removes moisture, and that brings the system into a vacuum. What that vacuum does is it lets the moisture do exactly what the AC system is doing, it's uh, boiling, right? Because you've removed the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, by turning it to a vacuum. That allows the water to boil into a gas, and then it pulls all that gas out of the system. So that's why we turn this into you know, as close to 30 inches of vacuum as we possibly can. Then we do a partial charge to make sure there's no leaks. We don't want to put all that refrigerant and have it leak out in the atmosphere. And newer machines actually do this automatically. And then we repair leaks if needed, recharge the system, 
partial charge again, make sure it's good, and then finish the charge, and then remove dirt debris from condenser, clean the system, do a performance test, and then move on. So it's kind of a process. You'll learn more about this in the AC class, but just over capping it. This is a pressure gauge, or known as a manifold. You have a high and a low side you connect to the system. It's going to tell you the pressures of the different systems. The technician will use this to not only diagnose the system, you know, find out what's working, what's not, but can also use it to charge the system and recover the refrigerant in the system. Some of the pressures the tech will look at uh, look like this. So you look at high side and low side of 134. That's the type of refrigerant. There's also 12. And then we have 1234 now. So it seems kind of confusing, but three different refrigerants. They operate at different pressures and different temperature correlations. So sensors, pressure sensors, they all work different on different systems. So you'll need one of these charts, and that helps you. But the gist is, for the most part, um, they, they behave similarly, but a little bit different as far as temperatures and pressures. Electronic leak detector. Uh, what this is going to do is detect that refrigerant leaking out of the system. It's an audible sound when it detects that refrigerant. We also have fluorescent detection, where you fill a dye with oil <clears throat> into the system. So where there's a leak and you use a black light, that nah, lights up. You can see where that leak is. And then you can fix it and then recharge it and move on. So here's a picture of what it looks like without a black light. Can you imagine what this one would look like with a black light? Yeah, this one would jump right out at you. Um, obviously, that, that compressor is bad. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, refrigerant identifier. This is important because as you recover that refrigerant, it's going into your shop machine. If this car came from somewhere else, a different state, or a backyard mechanic shop, it may not have the appropriate refrigerant in it. And if you recover without identifying it, you're going to contaminate your refrigerant and you can't use it and it's expensive to get rid of. Uh, so this system will also check for any type of stop leak. Uh, you don't want any stop leak in your system that can clog the system. So. It's going to check for stop leak. Um, well, this one, eh, no, this one does not. Some systems do. This one does not check for stop leak. You have to run a little orifice, uh, like a little separate little orifice tube in the system. But uh, it's going to check. Definitely this one will control panel right here. This will tell you the type of refrigerant in it. And then this filter needs to be there to protect this machine. So here's your RRR, Recovery Recycle Recharge Station. Uh, high and low side. This one can actually have the pressures built into it. It's got a control panel so you can do the recovery, um, the evacuation, and then the recharge all in one. Diagnosis, inject oil, it's kind of a big big deal, but could be expensive if it doesn't work. So what else do we check? Well, well AC belt uh, or the AC systems ran off a belt and that tension needs to be appropriate. If it's too tight you can burn up bearings in the front accessories of the engine. If it's too loose, it can squeal and not transfer power. So it's got to be just right. Here's a belt tension gauge that literally I've never met anyone that uses. <laughs> it's all kind of a subjective feel. You just grab the belt and kind of twist it. Or the it'll have a built-in on the tensioner, a little gauge that shows you where this line is right here. See this line that comes up right here? So you have A normal and B is new. And if it gets outside this line, then it's stretched and old needs to be replaced. So these are on automatic belt tensioners. If it's a system where you have to create the tension, um, then you're going to want to feel it's subjective and you'll learn that in engines and AC. Make sure that the condenser is clean of debris. You want airflow for the purpose of rejecting that heat, like we mentioned earlier. So again, make sure all that heat is dumping out of the system. Um, getting out of the system, you want to make sure there's no bees and debris all clogged up in here. It'll overheat the engine and make the AC not work. So how do we control all this? Well, one thing you're familiar with is fresh air, right? So if you have your recirculated air and um, fresh air buttons on your dash, what does that do? Well, this X signifies uh, your HVAC ducting inside your vehicle, all the, the, the duct work and the components. When you push on it for recirculated air, it basically does this. It just recirculates the air in the cabin. When I do fresh air, it brings in fresh air from that cowl through the car and out the vents in the back. So that's kind of the difference between fresh and recirculating air. Um, hot days and AC, you run max AC, that automatically will run a recirculate air. If you do that all the time and then turn the car off, this evaporator will uh, get kind of wet on the outside because all that moisture there. And then that water creates mold and stinks. So the thing I like to recommend to customers or family members or friends or whatever, uh, students, before you park the car, when you get close, you know, within a couple of miles of your house, turn it back to fresh air. And I turn my AC off and then let the whole system dry out 
before I turn my vehicle off. And that helps with that musty, nasty smell um, for sure. Okay, so inside that ducting, here's what you have. You have control modes, temperature uh, blend doors, uh, mode blend doors, blower fan, air inlet. So air coming in right here. There's a door that says that will help guide air from fresh air or recirculate air back and forth. The blower, the squirrel cage, this is what blows the air through. Temperature control. This right here is that evaporator. Yep, the AC system. So if you're running AC, it's going to go through this. Well, actually, air always goes through this. But if the AC's on, it's going to get cold and dry right here. If you want it to be hot, then this door, this temperature blend door, moves down. All the air goes through the heater core, and then it gets warmed up. Once it gets right here, these doors will dictate if it goes up to the defrost, to the vent, or down to your feet. So these doors here, here, and here can either be uh, cable, old school, they can be electronic, they can be vacuum. So as a technician, we want to make sure that all of these doors are working. If I have a car that's not getting hot, but I got full coolant and the hot, the tubes going to this heater core are hot, then maybe this temperature door is not working. Maybe it's stuck on cold, it's blocking right there. I don't know, it's possible. Um, again, this fresh air door could be broken. These mode doors could be broken. So as a tech, you want to kind of figure out is it is the AC not working because AC is not working, or is this blend door not working? Is it in the engine bay, or is it in the capacitor compartment? Is it a button? So these are things you'll learn in engines and AC class. Again, here's that heater core. They also have an auxiliary control valve, so I can actually turn off the hot air going or hot air hot, hot water going to the heater core. So if I want to run AC more efficiently, this valve turns off, blocks hot water, so the heater core isn't hot. So the airflow coming in. Uh, has no chance of being heated and stays cold. So this could be broken though, and that wouldn't let you get heat. Another thing to think about. Here's another picture of that valve. Cable operated, blocks water to the heater core, could get plugged up and prevent heat. So another reason why you could have no heat. Here's another picture of that blend door process. So if we want heat, this temperature blend goes up here, all the air goes through the heater core. If we want air conditioning or no heat, this blend door goes down, all the air goes around it. Here's an electric servo motor. Uh, this one I told you electronic. It'll turn that door with a little gear to tooth inside here. These typically will go bad. They'll start clicking. Click, 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 or you hear the thump, thump, thump noise in the dash. So move your temperature and blend doors and mode doors and figure out which one um, will stop making the noise. Once you find out which button makes the noise stop, go hot, cold, defrost, floor, and wait. Move them around, and when it stops making the noise, that's the mode door that's stripped and broken pretty common problem so some cars have cabin air filters too this is going to filter the air when you do you hit fresh air and air comes in from the outside this will filter that air some are charged with uh, carbon uh, kind of a charcoal to eliminate odors and molds so some cars don't have them they're typically behind the glove box if the car is going to have it so here's some examples of a plugged fresh air vent under along that cowl that's where your fresh air is coming in from and then here's that Cabin filter, uh, obviously old on the left, new on the right. It's HEPA filter. They need to be changed and serviced regularly if the vehicle has it. Not all vehicles have it. And then here's a picture of an F-150 that I pulled the dash apart on. <clears throat> and then you'll see the evaporator right there. Heater core used to sit right here, and the tubes went out. And then there's a clamshell top on this ducting. And then there's a transfer here. This little foam duct goes into the dash, and then the whole dash goes back on this rail. And you put everything back together. Piece of cake, right? Another view from the back of the dash. Here's where it meets up, the ducting right there. And then here's one where um, I took a part on a Focus. Actually, wasn't HVAC work. I was rewiring the whole Focus, a new loom, putting a new loom in that caught on fire. But um, right here you see the duct work and the servo motors right there. This is a lot of the, the fan blower motor right here. The fresh airs come in, and it goes into the dash right here. The electric servo motors that we talked about, so all that ducting hidden behind the dash that you can't see. Here is an F-250 that I pulled the dash on to change. Uh, if I remember right, this was an evaporator temp sensor. That's been about 10 years. Apparently, I worked in a library looking at this picture here. <laughs> I had a lot of books in there. But, uh, yep, F-250, and then pulled the dash and changed that duct work and put it back together. There's ducting right here that goes to the floor. And then, of course, AC mode control right there. And um, that's how you manipulate all the systems electronically if it's automated. But 
that's basically it. That's going to be most of everything that we're talking about for AC and HVAC. Um, if you have any questions, email me. Thanks for watching.